G'day everyone, welcome to Daz Talks Footy, I'm Daz, I talk footy, hence the title of the channel and I'd just like to say a quick thank you so much to everyone that has subscribed. I wanted to get to 100 before the end of the year and we have absolutely smashed that target. We are already over 100 and we're only in the middle of November. I honestly can't believe it, but I do have to say a massive thank you to everyone who has already subscribed and if you haven't, please do so as quickly as you can and get a mate through as well because we're all going on a footballing journey together and the content is only going to be getting better and better and better as I improve. Hopefully the videos improve and we can go from there. But today we are going through every team's best win of 2021. We're going to spread that love and go on a bit of a nostalgic journey because outside of footy, 2021 hasn't been the greatest year for all of us, I don't think. So I think every fan base having something to smile about might be a beautiful thing, especially on a wintry day such as this. this is the day I'm recording. The weather is genuinely shithouse, which is why I'm rugged up in a big-ass hoodie, but let's get into it. So, since we're going in alphabetical order, let's begin with Adelaide. Now, I would argue that Adelaide didn't play a better game of football than the Round 1 win over Geelong. They generally did not give Geelong a chance to win that game at any stage. But does that make it the best win of 21? I don't think so. This is... O'Brien, Seedsman, it's smothered by Brayshaw. Oh, the scenes as Brayshaw gets it high. It's all or nothing. All or nothing. Ring the bell. Ring the bell. The bell in the city of Churches. This game might not be remembered as an instant classic, but it was a classic game of 2021. At the end of the quarter, no lead was greater than a goal. Clayton Oliver put together individually one of the better performances of 2021 with 38 disposals and three goals. But Rory Laird, Ben Keyes and Paul Seisman combined for 104 disposals and three goals between them. And don't forget, Tex Walker made Stephen May look silly throughout big parts of this game and Stephen May ended up being the All-Australian for 2021 and All-Australian for 2021. Melbourne were undefeated heading into this game. I think I was the only person in Australia who tipped Adelaide, and I'm pretty sure I did that when I was drunk. This was an incredible win from Adelaide fans. Your start of the year was fantastic, and I know the back end, you guys fell away, but you'll look back on this win and know that you got one up on the reigning Premier. Let's move on to Brisbane. Now, when it comes to the Lions, because they didn't have a fantastic September, it would be easy to sweep wins under the carpet because when they were supposed to win, they faltered a little. But we need to look at the point in the competition when the whole league were taking Brisbane seriously in 2021, and it happened on a Friday night in round 15. They've taken a big, big scalp and a huge step towards guaranteeing themselves a double chance. Listen to the noise in Brisbane. What was most impressive about this win for me is that Brisbane took apart the Cats as a team. You had Daniel Rich, who had his 10 rebounds and his 25 disposals. Lockie Neal and Jared Lyons had about 50 disposals between them. And you've got Dane Zorko, and I'll touch on him in a sec, who dominated. But this was an all-round performance from Brisbane. No one was exceptionally, you know, BOG, come grab the three votes, but no one played terribly either. It was such a well-rounded performance that we went, maybe Brisbane can beat you a number of different ways. And I know that there are probably jokes that are going to be made in the comments about how they choked in the finals. And you can say that if you want, that's fine. That's not for me to debate. But at this point in time, when this Friday night game finished, we all went, Brisbane can win the flag. And that's why it's their best win. But I do want to touch on Dane Zorko because he achieved something in the NBA that's extremely rare. And I'd love to know how rare it is in the AFL. I don't think I have the time to check, but if someone can, that would be great. But he had a quadruple double. So he had 24 disposals, 10 marks, 12 tackles, and 12 score involvements. That is just insane. And this was a fantastic victory for the Lions. If you're new to the channel, first of all, subscribe, like I've already said, but a lot of Carlton fans are really annoyed with me because of my Luke Sayers video saying that his finals expectation was dooming Carlton. Um, if you want a bigger breakdown on that, you can look on the page or I'll put it in the description, but a few Carlton fans are pretty annoyed with me, so I offer you a peace offering. At quarter time in this game, you kind of looked down and out, even though you were only down a couple of goals, and although statistically you didn't do well, what I loved about this Carlton performance and why I think it's your best win, in a nutshell is because you took your chances, you played a fast, exciting brand of football, and you used your momentum to beat a rival. This is the highest scoring game of the year. Mackay's going to finish it after the siren. Yep, it was a high scoring, high paced game of footy that as a neutral was unbelievable to watch on a Sunday afternoon. And I reckon it was as cold as it is today. As well, Sam Walsh did what Sam Walsh does, and this man is going to win a Brownlow one day, unless injuries wreck his career, 
Knock on wood that they don't. But he had 33 and 8 clearances. But David Cunningham dominated as well. He was very good, including the winning goal or the ceiling goal in that game. Harry McKay played really well. Cal Hooker did kick five for the Bombers, if I can offer them one consolation prize. But your game is coming up soon. But I think Carlton are the kind of team that can use games like these, not necessarily as the standard, because we know how hard it is to have games that both teams kick 100 points in, but they can look at the way they played, especially in, in big patches of the second quarter. They can look at the fact that once they got the ball and realized they were out, they trusted their foot skills, and they didn't always go to plan. Essendon did kick goals off turnover, but... Even when those goals were being kicked against them, Carlton kept taking the game on and kept linking up with handball, especially off the half-back line. Keep doing more of it. I love it. And fingers crossed Michael Voss brings in that extra toughness to the Carlton side because you guys can go places. I just hope you don't try to run before you walk. That's all. But this, an amazing win. If you're thinking to yourself, Nathan Buckley's last game against Melbourne was their best win of 2021, I honestly don't blame you. Melbourne didn't beat Collingwood at any stage throughout 2021, so Collingwood fans have got that to hang their hat on. Although Mel uh, Collingwood were fantastic in that game, I would argue that not only was it not their best performance, but it wasn't their best win. Collingwood and Melbourne was a scrappy game at times that Collingwood eventually broke away from. But if I'm talking best win, they ended a team season by playing one of the best halves of football in wet weather I've seen in a very long time. They did it late in the year when they completely dominated West Coast. Spare a thought for Shannon Hearn in game 300. His team has not at all honoured a magnificent career. Listen, if you can end someone's season by kicking 10 goals to one in the first half, that's probably going to get you in the best win column. Jack Crisp, Jordan Ngoi, and Taylor Adams were simply outstanding, and 10 players for Collingwood took nine-plus marks in the wet. That just should be it. Conversation over. This was the best win for Collingwood. If you want to pick the Melbourne game, I don't blame you at all. But for mine, it is definitely this one. And it's not really that close for me. How close is it for you, Collingwood fans? Let me know. Many tipped Essendon to be genuinely shithouse in 2021. None more so than Xavier Ellis, who picked them to be bottom of the ladder. But hey, that's just me rubbing in a little bit. But they were 4-6 and six going into this game. And it was definitely season on the line. But they went on the road and stunned the world when they did this. Oh, up they go, Waterman's got it! To put the first nail in the West Coast coffin, and he does! He does! This could be one of the great Essendon wins of all time! Certainly recent history! Waterman kicks the goal! I'm sorry to do this again to you West Coast fans, but yes, you gave up, and I don't think it's the last one in this clip that you're going to be in, so I apologise. But let's go to the Essendon fans. You were 17 points down at half time, and the Eagles had kicked nine goals straight. Everything was going against you at this point. Dom Sheed may have had 43 disposals, but Zach Merritt had 37. Darcy Parrish had 36. But it was your clean ball use. It was your composure, and it was your ability to hurt the Eagles in transition that was so impressive in this game. And even though it was still a shock that you finished in the eight, it was games like this that was the catalyst on why. It wasn't your biggest win in terms of margins. It was your biggest win for the season. And now we've got Fremantle, and there's a few types of wins that you can have in the AFL. You can have comeback wins. You can have confident wins. You can have development wins. You can have character-building wins. And you can have dominant wins. And Freo's best win of the year was a pure and utter annihilation. Now, this is one of those rare times where beating a bad side was your best win. But Frio played at a stadium that they didn't have a fantastic record at. I know they've won at this ground a couple of times. I think actually maybe only once. But sort of things were going against them going into this game. It was a ground that they couldn't really win at against an opponent that although they'd beaten earlier in the year, they didn't have a fantastic record against. And they came out and punched them in the face. They punched my boys in the face at Tassie. Doesn't quite get it over the top of Granger Barras. Follows up his work, though, to Banfield. He's got man out. Fife lets it go. <laughs> Could have grabbed it, the skipper, but he was happy for Banfield to kick his third, and it's now a rout in Tassie. It was the epitome of dominance here for the Dockers, and I'll prove it to you. Their top six disposal getters were Andy Brayshaw with 32, Nat Fife 31, David Mundy 30, and two goals. Sarong 30, Adam Chera 26, and Sean Darcy 25. That is your Ruckman and your midfield core taking the piss all over the park. That's pretty much it. Analysis over. Freo's best win was a dominant victory over the Hawks and well played to them. This was not a happy game for me.
If you are plus 16 in contested ball, plus 35 in uncontested ball, and plus 9 in contested marks, in conditions which weren't perfect for football, you should be winning the game, and winning it pretty easily. However, the opposition were pretty rugged when the Cats met them down at GMHBA Stadium, and sometimes in a game of football, you need a special moment to win, or it takes a special moment for you to lose the game. It was a special moment that lost the Dogs the game, and a special one for the Cats to win it. Rowan, the game on his boot. What's he got from the set shot? It's coming back. It's through. He's won the game for Geelong. Unbelievable. Yep, Gary Rowan became the second player behind Barry Hall to kick a goal after the siren twice to win a game. And interestingly, both of them did it at different clubs, with Barry Hall doing it for St Kilda in 2001 against Hawthorne and for Sydney against Brisbane in 2005. And Gary Rowan had done it for Sydney against Essendon, I think, in 2018 and in this game as well. And although he hasn't got the greatest reputation as a bloke, Gary Rowan is a dead-eyed dick in front of goals when he's consistent enough to kick them. But the Cats were really impressive in this win because Isaac Smith... Joel Selwood, Tom Stewart, Sam Inagola, Danger, and Zach Tui were all fantastic. And if you're thinking to yourself, hang on, they did win a final. Yeah, they won a final against a GWS team that was waiting to be slaughtered. So good luck to you if you go, it's a final, it's a non-negotiable. I'm not going to disagree with you, but their best win of the season came off their best moment of the season, which in my mind is this one. Quick story time here. I met my partner's dad on the night that this game in question was taking place, and he and my partner's family barrack for the opposition. So, oh boy, this got awkward. But Gold Coast fans, feel free to enjoy this one because between me and you, so did I. It's a signature win for the Gold Coast Suns. Their very existence has been questioned by their critics. Don't know whether it was because he plays for Gold Coast or because this game was on a Friday night or a Thursday night, potentially. But Took Miller proved to the competition and everyone, media and fans alike and on the same wavelength, all agreed that Took Miller is an A-plus player. Now, shame on the media for not realising this earlier, but what did he have? 36 disposals and clearly dominated and proved that he and Sam Walsh are the clear one and two hardest working two-way midfielders in the competition. Jack Lacocious reminded us that he's a fairly good footballer with 24 and 10 marks and Ben King kicked four. But let's be honest, Richmond had no right being this close to them. Gold Coast kicked 10 goals, 17, I think it was in the end. And the Tigers did lead late, but in no way looked the better team. And unlike the Richmond fans that I watched this with, it was not the umpire's fault. In 2021, the GWS Giants' depth was tested unlike most teams in the competition. So in round 21, when Jacob Hopper, Stephen Canelio, Tom Green, Josh Kelly, Jesse Hogan, Matt Flynn and Daniel Lloyd all didn't play... Not only were they not given a chance to win this game, I think they were the highest priced team to win a game in 2021, according to the betting markets. They had no chance and no right, but they bloody did it in one of the best home and away wins of 2021. Low one, Shipley, there we are. What a famous win this is. Yes, Isaac Cumming had 34 disposals. Tim Torino had 34 disposals and two goals. But can I just take a moment to talk about the blatant highway robbery of Sam Taylor not receiving votes here at all? 21 touches and 12 marks on last year's Coleman medalist was a crime that he was not picked up for votes. It doesn't mean that we need a complete overhaul on how the Brownlow is judged. But for crying out loud, this was an absolute abomination. And I know the umpires cop a lot of shit and they've got a lot of things to do. I am an umpire sympathizer. I know not a lot of fans are, but I certainly am. This was a mistake and an oversight on their part. GWS for fantastic and not only beat up the Giants at the ball, but burst from the stoppage a hell of a lot better. And I'm not taking the Geelong were lethargic uh, excuse. All their players are above 30 and they made these decisions. If you're too tired, rest. Well, I feel like this is going to be an unpopular opinion amongst Hawks fans, but bear with me. I didn't pick the Brisbane game, and I didn't pick the Bulldogs game. Both games were a Tassie, and the Fortress does hand an advantage, but I didn't pick them because neither team was in that fantastic a form, and even though the upsets were drastic, don't get me wrong, I feel like going on the road and beating a top eight team is better than beating one at your unofficial home ground. And earlier in the year, the Hawks took a top eight team apart. Here it is. 
stay in touch with the top four. They've let one they should have won slip. And the brown and gold will be very, very happy. Another reason I didn't take this game is because in the last quarter of the Brisbane and the Bulldogs game, the Hawks took their foot off the pedal, but they didn't in this one, kicking 4-1 to 1-5. They had a killer mentality about them for every quarter, I feel like, and that well-rounded performance is why I gave them the lift here. Tom Mitchell, you can call him what you want. I feel like he is becoming so overrated by fans, he's now becoming underrated. He is what he is. He's a ball getter who's not the best kick but can feed out to better midfielders, and as long as Hawthorne don't have better midfielders around him, it's going to look like his output isn't as great. But the man is a fantastic footballer and should be judged that way. Uh, but he had a 34, a goal, seven tackles, five rebounds, genuinely dominated. CJ, or Chankwath Giath, for those that are still unsure on how to pronounce his name, had 28 and genuinely took the piss. And speaking of taking the piss, John Newcomb was drafted in the mid-season draft nine days ago and had 14 tackles on debut. Yep, that happened. Best win of the year, and for mine, not really that close. All right, next we move on to Melbourne, and this was probably the most difficult one to pick. I'm just kidding. Of course, it's this one. Tom McDonald times the ticking. Every heart is beating true and blue for the red and blue. After 57 long years, the Demons are premiers in 2021. Extraordinary stuff. And McDonald kicks the goal. Melbourne scored 358 points in the final series and conceded 168. For the record, that's about 120 to 56 per final. Unbelievable. And unless you're a Dogs fan, for crying out loud, go watch that third quarter again. It genuinely was one of the best quarters of footy I've seen a team play in a very long time. That grand final, all of Melbourne's 20-plus disposal getters, it read like a dream if you had it presented it to Melbourne fans at the start of the game. Petrarca, Oliver, Salem, Brayshaw, Viney, Neil Bullen, and Max Gorn all had 20-plus. What a fairy tale, but let's be honest, this was a group achievement, and I do feel for Nathan Jones the fact he doesn't get a medal, but that man will be revered by football fans and, of course, Melbourne fans, not only in this lifetime, but the next. What a star. North Melbourne, and this one, it was down to two games. Now, the reason why I haven't picked the Hawthorne game is not bias, I promise you. I have consulted with a couple of football friends, and they think that I'm on the right track here. So if you think we're wrong, you feel free to tell us. It was a fantastic comeback. Hawthorne took their foot off the pedal, and North punished them. But they went on a road in conditions that didn't suit them and did this. Oh, reverberate with the old Shinbiters and the new Kangaroos. What a victory! It was just an unbelievable win, and one that they had no right in winning prior to the game, if you listen to all the media. Jaden Stevenson is a very silly boy, we know, but 38 disposals took the absolute piss. Jai Simpkin had 32, uh, Jack Zebel 27, and Ben Cunnington had 25. They were all fantastic. West Coast fans, again, I am sorry that so many of your losses are in here, but jeez, you had some stinkers. I mean, come on. I mean, you'll get the fun at the end of the video, I promise. But, oh boy. I don't really believe in conspiracy theories, not even really football ones, but if there was one that I really do subscribe to, it's that Port Adelaide need a prelim final away from home and away from expectations. Now, does that make them mentally weak? Of course. But anything can happen in a grand final, and clearly they can't win a prelim final from home. Boy, can they win a qualifying final at home, though. Have a listen to this. Port Adelaide genuinely turned the screws on Geelong all night, and from a fan of a team that does hate Geelong... It was delightful to see, and for Port Adelaide fans, the expectations that this would have set would have been enormous, but you still deserve to enjoy this type of win, even if it is balanced out by the disappointment of the prelim final. But if you look at the fact that they won contested and uncontested ball, tackles, tackles inside 50s, inside 50s, time in possession, and time in forward half, and not just won them, won them convincingly... They're positives to take out of it. Again, I understand the frustration from the prelim final loss, but we're here to enjoy it. Maybe not so for Geelong fans in this case, but you get my point. Razzle Dazzle kicked four. Ollie Wines had 33. Travis Boak, 32. And Carl Amon had 25. 
And Port Adelaide fans, I need to know, does this win still fill you with pride? Certainly was a season of what could go wrong did go wrong for Richmond, which is why I think they'll rebound next year in a big way. But when it comes to their best win of 2021, it was pretty much up to one man, even though the team performed spectacularly. But it was a one-man show, and that man was Jack. Not just that, but to keep the Tigers alive in 2021. It was that all-round team performance, uh, disposals-wise. Jaden Short had 27, and no one else had above 24. Jack Graham, who I believe should be the next captain of Richmond, had 19 in kick two. But again, it was that kind of all-round performance that we'd grown accustomed to from 2017 to 2020 from the Tigers. Jack kicked six, and the new boom recruit at Gold Coast, Marby Orchol, kicked four. And this was the kind of night that even if you weren't the biggest fan of Richmond due to their success, seeing Jack kick six, it was a nice thing and a good win for Richmond. But like I said, I expect them to bounce back next year. What do you guys think? I thought Halloween was only supposed to be for one day of the year, but St Kilda decided to dress up as me in front of my parents for the whole of 2021 to become a disappointment. Because, oh boy, they shat the bed on this one. And St Kilda fans, I know you're as frustrated as anyone else is watching you, especially after such an encouraging 2020. This all seemed to come crashing down, but their brightest spot was an almighty comeback at Marvel Stadium. They're pouring on through, and they're pouring them on to find a way to come back. But right now, the St... Again, seriously, West Coast fans, I'm sorry, but at this point, this is your fault. I'm not doing this deliberately, I can assure you. And I don't even hate West Coast, but let's talk about St. Kilda. Jack Steele, Jack Billings, Brad Crouch, Brad Hill, and Jack Zach Jones all completely dominated. Probably the only game for the season where they all were A or better, if you're looking at a letter grade, even though I'm not a big fan of doing that. I've done it. Hi, I'm a hypocrite. Um, the second half was fantastic. Max King kicked five, and he actually dominated West, uh, West Coast both times that they played. I think he kicked six in the Optus Stadium game later in the year. So, Bunny, potentially. But this was a fantastic comeback. West Coast had a lead of about 28 points in the third quarter. It was probably more than that. Probably should have checked that before I started. But it was one of the better comebacks of the year. St. Kilda have had a few beauties under Marvel Stadium lights. Ah, Sydney fans, I know what you're thinking. That Gabba win flew under the radar, and it did. The round one win over Brisbane was absolutely fantastic. But like I said in the Adelaide game, anything can sort of happen in round one. So I haven't picked it. Did Sydney prove that it wasn't a fluke? Oh yeah, they did at the MCG. Siren sounds, a famous, famous win for the Sydney Swans. If you say to Sydney fans, map out how you would like a victory to go. I'm pretty sure if Callum Mills could have 31, Ollie Florent, Jake Lloyd and Luke Parker could have 29 each, Jordan Dawson and Josh Kennedy could have 27 each, that would be a really good place to start. And all of that happened in this game. I know Richmond aren't the biggest team when it comes to getting disposals, but they're also trying to stop and harass you from getting disposals as well. And they just couldn't do it. Sydney outran and outworked Richmond all day and dominated in the forward half. This was a fantastic win. I believe they played better in this game than they did at the Gabba. And I do feel for Camden McIntosh in the way that he was knocked out in this game. Never a good look, but this was a wake-up call for Sydney to the competition to not sleep on them. Too many did, and they made the eight maybe a year earlier than they should have. And fingers crossed that they can continue that momentum in 2022 because they are building a special, special squad. Well, if I have to give Carlton a peace offering when this video basically started, I have to give one to West Coast at the end because I feel like I've trashed you a lot in this video without meaning to. You just had some stinkers. So here is my peace offering when Josh Kennedy set Optus Stadium alight in a win against the Tigers. Second quarter, what's the champ got? He bends it, he bends it, he bends it through! West Coast at the front! West Coast will win and beat the Tigers in front of a packed crowd! As much as we like seeing Elliot Yo back into the fold, this was actually West Coast's youth. With 19-year-old Luke Edwards having 22 disposals and Luke Foley, who was only 22 at that stage, I think he might have already turned 23, but he had 22 touches as well. And the old heads of Josh Kennedy and Jack Darling were really clutch late. And this was an awesome game. Dusty had a shot from 55 out to win the game and he landed the ball five meters short, but nobody talks about that. But anyway, West Coast fans, this was fantastic. And I don't know exactly where your list is at right now. And I think the next two years might be pain. But this, this was your golden nugget of 2021. And I'm sorry for all the bashing I've done so far. Here is my peace offering.
I love a win on the road. I love a win in hostile conditions. And I love a win in which no one expects you to get the result. Not only did not many people expect this result, no one could have predicted that this game would go the way that it did. The Doggies did struggle in the last 40 minutes of the grand final. They were beaten by a better team. But the week before... Whew. A bit of time and space. Looking for it. English touch play on the call. Bailey Smith, can he get goal number four? The soccer skills are there. Four goals. Play on. It's the underdogs. He's put on seven in the first quarter and 12 in the first half to punch Port Adelaide in the mouth. You can't do much more than that. Jackson McRae, Bailey Dale, Bailey Smith, Josh Dunkley, and the Bont genuinely destroyed Port Adelaide, who not only didn't have answers, didn't really look like they were trying to answer the challenge anyway. If you can get a team like Port Adelaide trying to tread water, you've already won the battle, in my opinion, and the Dogs did that from the start. We got a ton of great grand final stories leading into the week, and I know that Dogs fans are hurting after the grand final performance. If you need something to take the edge off on a cold day, put the prelim on, because it was absolutely unbelievable. All right, guys, that's it. 18 teams done and dusted. Their best win has been decided by yours truly. Did I get your team right or wrong? Comment below, let me know. Don't forget to drop a like on the video so more people can see it. It helps with the algorithm and all that. And if you have subscribed, click that bell notification. And if you haven't, just click that subscribe button. You can do it like that and it would really help me a lot. Trying to get to 250 by the end of the year and I would so, so appreciate if you could do so. But I would also like to hear from you guys. What do you guys want to see over the off season? I do have plenty of ideas, so don't think I've already run out. But I would love to know from the people that are watching these videos, is there something you're missing from your online footballing diet, let's say? Let me know what you want to see, and I want to work on some stuff that you guys want as much as I want to work on things that I want to do. I can't wait for the draft. I've got a couple of draft videos, uh, video ideas that I want to run with before the draft, so keep an eye out for that, and that's why I'm telling you to subscribe. Plenty of good stuff. I'll have a draft reaction afterwards. I'll have a fantasy video if you like your AFL fantasy or super coach. I'll have something like that after the draft done as well. Plenty of things happening. That's why I want you to stick around. I'll see you in the next one. Goodbye.